All right, we'll get uh, started with the questions here, and I'm sure Dennis will get back when he, uh, when he can. Um, Ms. Dalton. In Mr. Uh, Rector's testimony, he talked about 69 different programs. But I look at some of the things in your report, and you talk about 47 federal employment and training programs. I think in your testimony, 18 different food programs. Do, do we have any idea really what the number is? Is it 69? Is it 169? Is it 3 million? I mean, what, what's, the, what's the number of programs? What we did was we looked at functional areas and tried to identify as many programs as we could in those areas. So that's where you're seeing the numbers of 20 or 40 or 82, um, 47 <coughs> in the employment and training area. One of the difficulties is just trying to define what a program is. There's mm -hmm. not agreement on exactly what a program is, did so you, there may be some differences in definition. Did you categorize them the, the way I think we have, uh, programs providing food aid, housing, uh, social service programs, education programs, basic cash assistance programs, vocational training, job training programs, mm -hmm. medical programs, energy and utility assistance type programs, and then child care programs. Did you put them in the same broad, broad categories? We, we did very broad categories. In some cases, for example, in employment and training, you may have what we would include there is the full range of employment and training services. It may be targeted towards youth. It may be targeted towards adults. Okay. And if, but, but if you had to hazard a guess, what would, what would your number be? Um, I've been using sir. 70 for you know, just because, right. You know, you know certainly, you know, if you accumulated the numbers that we talked about today, it's in the hundreds. Hundreds, okay. So more than seven. Now, and, and would you agree with this concept that Mr. Rector raised, and it's, it's in, in the legislation that, that I've introduced and members of, some members have co-sponsored, um, saying it would help be helpful if we at least had an aggregate number, what the government spends each and every year um, on the 100-plus means-tested social welfare programs? It certainly, I think, would be good to have a number of how many programs there are, what exactly are we spending, and what are we getting for okay. that money. So it would be good to know the, the real number of programs in, in the various agencies, how much we totally spend, the aggregate, right. aggregate number, and then most importantly, are these things working. Exactly. And of that 100 plus programs, just, just for the committee and just for the record, uh, of the 100, can you tell? Um, can you tell how many of them are having a success with, with, the, with the people that they're, in, you know, intending to help? Certainly, in some of the areas, there is some information about the success of the programs. In many cases, there's Give me a no number. Of the 100-plus programs, how many programs? Is it single digits? Is it 20? Is it 50? What's the number that you would, based on your report, mm -hmm. based on all the good work you've done, what would you say of that 100-plus programs are actually helping the people they're supposed to help? It would be difficult for me to give you a specific number. So you, because you can't give a number. I you have can't. no idea. No. No clue. You know, I know it's not in single digits, but beyond that, I couldn't tell you. 20 percent? It's really hard to tell. You have to look Less than 50 percent? I really wouldn't want to hazard a guess. Okay. So it's, it's, just, it's just too hard to figure out. All right. Uh, thank you. The, the, Mr. Rector, in your testimony, you talked about uh, the, the wrong incentives we have. Not only do we don't know what, how many programs there are, how much money we spend, uh, but those pro all those programs across all these agencies, we send the wrong incentives. I, I, I've often said that the welfare system particularly says to the single mom out there, don't get married, don't get a job, have more kids, and you get more money. And, and, and is that a fair assessment of, of is, that, is that across the board in these 100-plus programs sending the wrong message? Or there, is it, Elaborate a little bit more on that if you could. Um. All of these programs have an anti-marriage effect because they are means-tested. And the way that works is that in a means-tested program, the more earned income there is in a household, the less, the lower the benefits will be. It's automatic. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what's the first way then to have a lower amount of earned income? Well, it's not to have a married husband in the household. Uh, if you have a married husband in the household, his income is automatically counted toward eligibility. So in each and every one of these programs, or almost every circumstance, the family will get less money uh, as a result of being married to an employed man. And the net result of that has been that basically these programs have supplanted uh, fathers as, as breadwinners throughout about a third of the U.S. population. 
When Lyndon Johnson started the war on poverty in 1964, 7 percent of American children were born outside marriage. Mm. Today that number is 42, 43 uh, percent. Forty percent of the births in the United States are paid for by Medicaid. Almost all of those are non-marital births. Mm -hmm. There's an incentive right there to begin with. We were just talking about that, that basically for many blue-collar families, if the, fam if the couple is married and the man does not have good health insurance policy, which is quite probable, then the cost of the childbirth to that married couple will be borne by the couple. On the other hand, if they separate, mm. and then, then Medicaid is almost inevitably going to pick up the full cost. So there's right there from the very beginning, the moment that a child is conceived, the state is staying in there and saying, as long as you don't get married, we're, you're on our dime. But if you're married to a working man, basically <coughs> you have to shoulder these costs. So. The, the, all of these programs uh, have an anti-marriage effect, and most of them have a very strong anti-work effect. Uh, and, and as a result of that, we basically have done the opposite of what Lyndon Johnson said we should be doing. We have, we, he, Lyndon Johnson said, I don't want to put people on the dole. In fact, I was just reading this marvelous thing in the 1964 economic report of the president where they're first talking about the war on poverty. And it actually says in there, it says, you know, we could wipe out all the poverty in the United States for $20 billion a year. We could just give people, pick up this money and give it to people, and then they would no longer be poor. But we're not going to do that because it would be wrong. Mm. <laughs> it actually says this. And, but what happened is we completely changed it. And, and so we then got in the business of giving people uh, support rather than trying to make them capable of supporting themselves more effectively, and in and in particular, we've basically displaced uh, marriage uh, in the low-income community. Mm -hmm. The single strongest cause of poverty in the United States today is the lack of marriage. Our society is dividing into two castes. In the upper top part, you have married couples, uh, children raised by married couples, both of whom have a college education. In the bottom, 40 percent of our population are mothers who are not married and they have a high school degree or less. That is the poverty population, and it's about over $300 billion a year in welfare assistance there, there as well. Great. Thank you. Gentlelady from New York. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and our apologies to all of the witnesses here for the, uh, the uh, temporary recess we had. My first question is for uh, Ms. Dalton, and then I have a question for all of the panelists. Um, in your, and this is really as a follow-up to the Chairman's question, um, you talk about measuring outcomes and understanding the effect of these programs. And I think that's so very important because when we talk about these programs, it's not an unwillingness on anyone's part to provide what we need for the neediest. But the issue is this is not our money. This is the American people's money. And we must be responsible stewards of that money. So I think we need to understand the impact studies. You stated that five out of the 47 programs have completed, an, have completed an impact study since 2004, and that in those five programs, any positive effects tended to be small, inconclusive, or restricted to short-term impacts. So I just want to be sure that I understand what you're, what you're saying there, that basically for the vast majority of the 47 employment training programs run by the federal government, using $18 billion of taxpayer money, there's little or no information about whether or not these programs actually work. Right. On the employment and training programs, there's some performance information that is collected. Um, the most common measure is entered employment. Did the person get a job? But it doesn't, that information alone really doesn't tell you what the impact of the program was. Did the person get a job? Did they retain the job? Did they, are they making a sustainable wage? So that's the type of information that really gets at impact. And that requires some pretty thorough study. You're also trying to see whether or not that pro the particular program is the causal agent of creating the, the impact. And at times in these areas where you've got multiple services coming from different programs, it's difficult to isolate it. But it's important to know that because then you know you have a good idea, you have a better idea of what really is working, where do you want to invest your money. 
Thank you. And my next question is for all four of the panelists. Um, the GAO's testimony today states that the federal government has spent about $90 billion on domestic food and nutrition assistance in fiscal year 2010. That's $90 billion. This is an update to the $62 billion in for fiscal year 2008. So that's an increase of 44 percent over two years. Um, so I would like to hear from each one of you on this. Um, is this a temporary increase? Is this the result of the financial crisis? Or do we have reason to believe that these increases and other social welfare programs will continue to increase? Much of the increase is, in fact, due to an increase in benefit levels that was included in the Recovery Act. Um, that, um, my understanding is that increase <coughs> will end in November of 2013. So a large percentage of that increase is, in fact, due to the Recovery Act legislation and then will recede to prior levels in November of 2013. Do we have any idea of the dollar amount? I can get that for you. I would appreciate that. Sure. Thank you. Mr. Rector? Um, I can get you the exact numbers on that. I, I believe that food stamps goes down slightly uh, a few years from now. Um, but overall food assistance, I believe, grows at m more than, than uh, the rate of inflation for the foreseeable future. Um, overall, when you look at all the different cash, food, housing, medical care, and social services, there is no decline in, in government spending even as the recession ends. Uh, and I can provide you with those numbers, but they are right in the back of President Obama's budget where, where no one would look at them. But they're they're all there, and in fact, all this spending continues to grow quite rapidly, uh, as far out as the president can project it. So, a lot of people regard spending on the poor or welfare spending like it's a roller coaster. That in a recession it goes up, and in in a good times it comes back down. And if you look in the back of my testimony. This is the picture of welfare spending adjusted for inflation since 1950, since the Korean War. You don't see too much coming down there. It's more like the Alps slope, right? It goes up rapidly or it goes up at a moderate pace. It, it never comes down. In fact, there are only about two years in this entire period where it actually came down. And that's the nature is that during a recession this money gets pumped up. We've pumped it up by 30 percent over the last two years, and then it never comes back down. And, and that's what the nation, I believe, just simply can't afford to do in the future. Thank you. I apologize, Mr. Pat Mashburn. I'm out of time. No, that's fine. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Mr. Mashburn. Uh, as Ms. Dalton mentioned, uh, ARA, the stimulus bill, as many people call it, increased the SNAP benefits by about 15 percent. But in addition to that, the reason the numbers might not come down is it also expanded eligibility, and many of those expansions of eligibility are proposed in the President's FY 2011 and his new FY 2012 budget, such as it eliminates the three-month time limit on benefits for able-bodied adults without children. And so they're just free. All those guys, they don't have any limit. So, so now food stamps is available to able-bodied men who aren't working. Yeah, yeah, as long as they don't have children. And, and, and increases the household income dollar limits in disregard. So the amount of money people can make uh, has gone up. But the income disregards, the things you don't count as income, has also gone up. Um, the uh, uh, EITC uh, used to be disregarded for three months. I think the President's proposal is it gets disregarded for 12 months. Well, if you disregard it for 12 months, you've completely disregarded it. And that's a $5,000 a month benefit, and it's not income. So as long as those uh, uh, asset tests and other eligibility requirements that restricted the caseload to the truly needy keep expanding, I don't see how you're ever going to get the program to, to fall. I mean, it, just this month, a man won $2 million in the, in, in the Michigan State Lottery. He's eligible for food stamps. He was on food stamps before. He's still eligible. And Michigan's been trying for two to three months to get him off, but they're restricted by the federal uh, asset test, that there is no asset test. So even though he bought a new house, a new car, the income that he has that comes in from the remaining part of his winnings that he's got left after the house and the car and everything else he bought is less than the eligibility cutoff for his benefits. And, uh, 
And I, and I just know, you know, in the new newspaper article, the uh, uh, State Human Services Department spokeswoman mentioned, you know, it's a federal policy. We've been trying, but we can't do it. And, and which is why a lot of people are proponents of block grants, because you can see the states knew that wasn't right and wanted to do something. It's the feds that are keeping them from doing the right thing. Thank you, Mr. Mashburn. Ms. Hamler? Food stamp participation has grown by 60.4 percent since February of 2008. It is at an all-time record high. Expenditures are up directly as a relate of the relation to the economy and the number of individuals who now find themselves in many cases working but uh, earning wages that don't lift themselves or their families out of poverty, or in many cases it has been the long-term unemployed, uh, many who have been unable, despite their best efforts, to find employment in their area. Certainly, um, we are concerned, and again, this is a supplemental program. Um, and individuals who are suffering from hunger and food insecurity, uh, they don't first turn to the SNAP program. They use five to seven different other coping strategies before they ever ask for help. They are selling their personal possessions on eBay, Craigslist, and at yard sales. They are sending their children to the homes of friends and neighbors in order to eat. The last place they turn is to the Public Welfare Office. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman from uh, Ohio. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, again, I want to thank you for holding this hearing and for allowing, inviting uh, Ms. Hamler Fugit, who plays such a critical role in providing food to families across our state, to testify at this hearing. The, st the statistics that she has uh, provided to this committee are shocking. Yesterday, when I, I met with her, she showed me uh, this map of Ohio, which uh, I would like to, uh, with Sorry. unanimous consent, enter into the record. Subject. It shows that in Ohio today, 70 of Ohio's 88 counties now have more than 25 percent of their residents eligible for emergency uh, food. Uh, you know, I, I look at, at our state and I think of, you know, all of us who serve it, and we are representing counties in which 30 to 35 percent of the population are at or below 200 percent Federal poverty level, which is a threshold for eligibility for food assistance programs. Now, you know, we share uh, a desire to ensure our constituents in Ohio and across the country are able to put enough food on the table so their children don't go hungry and the elderly aren't, uh, um, aren't forced to, um, un even more unfortunate circumstances, trying to find available supplemental uh, food. Families are still struggling with hunger, even as they rely on current Federal uh, food assistance programs and local resources. Uh, and I would like to make a commitment to you today, Mr. Chairman, to uh, work together to determine how we can best streamline these programs to eliminate administrative inefficiencies. Uh, but as we have this conversation about funding, uh, finding program uh, efficiencies, uh, I am very concerned that we don't weaken programs' ability to, to meet uh, needs, uh, neither by reducing benefits or cutting eligibility for those who need assistance. So I am I'm, I'm letting you know that I uh, look forward to working with you so that we can ensure that these critical food programs are protected from further budget cuts and from current levels of food assistance. And, uh, you know, can, can we do something together on that, Mr. Chairman? Well, yeah, I thank the gentleman for his, uh, his um, focus here. Um, look, our, our job is to make these systems work better and ultimately help the people that the programs are intended to help. And by so doing, you save money for the taxpayer at, frankly, this, this critical time for um, in America's fiscal, you know, when you think about our fiscal situation, so that's our focus as as uh, as conservatives. We want to we want to help the folks that need help, and by so doing, you're going to save money. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there's a, a real weight that's put on us here because we have to make sure that as we're analyzing these programs, uh, in our in our desire to streamline them, that we're not inadvertently lowering 
the benefits that are available at a time of highest demand. I mean, that is one of the reasons Ms. Hamler Puget uh, came forward with this testimony that is so important to um, people that, that she serves. And again, this is all just trying to make sure that people are hungry, have some resource somewhere so they are not left out. I mean, we can, we can get into ideology about how this, how this happens. And I might agree with you on some of those things, but I, I just I'm I'm concerned that that we stay focused on wherever they have programs that are working that are feeding people. That you know we keep doing it. Uh, I, I want to say to Ms. Uh, Hamlet Puget, it's you know you're, you're saying there have been two problems with uh, food assistance and other service programs available in Ohio. First, do, do you not believe they're adequately funded? That that's your, I mean that's obvious to your pitch. Is that right? That's correct, sir. And then uh, you believe that some of the differing rules and application processes are causing eligible needy people to miss out on benefits for which they are eligible. Is that right? That is correct, sir. And then uh, what, would you, what can we do to make uh, accessing benefits simpler and more efficient? Uh, one is that we have to align and integrate the systems that, that manage them. I think certainly the, the frustration and my own frustration in reading the GAO report is that we lack data. We lack data because we have uh, antiquated systems that were developed uh, on a cobalt platform which is more than 50 years old. IT uh, um, graduates are not trained in cobalt. In, in fact, in our state, we need to bring people out of retirement to reprogram basic systems. Um, and I see the chairman smiling. He remembers this at the state. Um, we need to invest in the technology that is available. We have uh, worked on this at the State level. We need to mandate that both the Federal and the State agencies with jurisdiction over these programs work together, uh, ensuring that we are not writing redundant rules and regulations. Uh, we need to uh, certainly ensure that access points, but also at the same time as maintaining integrity. Uh, in our shop, dollars, uh, data equals dollars. And it is very clear to me that that is what we are missing. We have undertaken independent research on our benefit bank. Um, in fact, we have been working with the Voinovich School uh, at Ohio University to evaluate not only the impact of integrating programs and service delivery, but also doing longitudinal studies on those who are participating in the program so we can make informed decisions about where we go. Um, but to blame the poorest of the poor, the hungriest of the hungry, because of a failure to collect adequate information um, is unconscionable. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Hamler, is, you said participation in your programs is up. Currently, yes, sir. And, and by what percentage? Uh, we're up nearly forty-seven percent. Forty-seven percent. So, so a few years back, when the economy was in a much better situation, you had much fewer participants in your program, much less need for your food assistance program. It has uh, been climbing, uh, not as drastically as it has in the past few years, as a direct result of the Great Recession, but it has been climbing um, since the onset of welfare reform. And certainly we saw many folks who left the system, did not know that other supportive services were available. Let me ask you this. Ms. Do, you, do you anticipate, as the economy improves, do you anticipate your numbers going down? And has that been the pattern in the past? How, how, uh, have you seen when good economic times, you have, they have less, bad economic times, you have, you have more participants? No, unfortunately, we haven't. And certainly within uh, Ohio, what so you don't you you don't anticipate any when when the economy improves, which we all hope it does sooner rather than later. You don't anticipate any any uh, less participants in your program. I don't. And if you just look at the the data, um, Ohio currently ranks 50th out of uh, all states in income growth. And why? Wh but but again, I'm going back to the, I think the point Mr. Rector made. Most people assume when the economy improves, there's less need for social services. It would be so if the jobs that were coming back paid a livable wage, but certainly what we have seen is the uh, surge in minimum wage jobs that are being created in the State, and uh, over half of the 31,000 jobs that were created over the last year came uh, in the retail sector or paying uh, minimum wage or slightly above minimum and wage. And is there any, can you attribute any of the growth over, because you, you said it has been 
a, a higher uh, growth rate the last few years, but it was growing even in 2005, 2006, a few years, years, years back. Is any of that attributable to a um, broader definition about who qualifies, or, or, or how, does it, how does it work? On the food stamp program, we certainly have made some changes, and, and I would say that some of those policy changes uh, have brought more people in. It's also been about education, uh, assuring people who are standing in our food lines that the food stamp or the SNAP program were available. We have been pretty aggressive in our outreach. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, our goal is that we want people standing in grocery store checkout lines instead of food pantry lines making healthy decisions for themselves and their families. Okay. Um, uh, one, one other question then, then, then to you. Wouldn't you agree, though, that, that it would help if we actually knew how many social welfare programs actually exist in the Federal Government, how much we totally spend, and whether those programs actually are helping the people they are intended to help? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. That is good government. Okay. Okay, good. Mr. Uh, Mashburn, uh, talk to me a little bit more about the, this, this whole block grant concept and, and this uh, seems to me you, 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 get, you get the dollars to the local level to people like Ms. Hamler uh, who actually are going to work with the folks on the state level, local level. That makes a lot of sense. And, and, the, uh, and, and how it was used with TANF and uh, give me the broader perspective on, on, on the block grant concept. Well, the block grant concept. The, the block grant grant concept, as far as TANF was concerned, was uh, initially we proposed, I was Senator Ashcroft as LD back then, initially we proposed a bare bones block grant, which was you took the amount of money and you sent it to the states and you, uh, uh, you didn't do a maintenance of effort requirement on the states. And then in the negotiations, Clinton administration and others, there was a maintenance of effort requirement imposed on the states. And then the governors came in and said, if you are going to require us to keep spending what we are spending, then you at the federal level got to keep spending what you are spending. So you guaranteed that level at the federal level. You didn't index it for inflation. But that kind of had a, a, a strange effect in, in that uh, the state bureaucracies knew that they were going to get a guaranteed amount of money, mm -hmm. and they knew that if they reduced the rolls, they weren't going to lose any of that money. And then the, whatever savings they had, they were required to then spend it on the harder to place population. And that had a lot of the effect in changing the welfare bureaucracies from basically a uh, caseload enrollment center into employment agencies and getting people out, getting people training, getting people off the rolls. So the work requirements changed the attitudes and the motives of the recipients. Mm -hmm. But the funding mechanism through the uh, uh, capped but guaranteed uh, level of Federal spending changed the motivations, the economic incentives for the bureaucracies themselves. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to worry about losing money. And they also weren't able to count on being given more money like under AFDC, where every time you enrolled a yeah. new recipient, you got 80 percent of your costs from the Federal Government. Let me ask you one, one more question for both you and Mr. Rector. The um, very first piece of legislation I ever got passed as, as a member of the Ohio General Assembly was time limits for able-bodied adults uh, receiving cash assistance. And um, we argued at the time that, and I think we were proven right, uh, deadlines influence behavior, and if able-bodied adults know that there will come a point where they will no longer be eligible for the benefit, and in this case it was cash assistance, it influenced what they did. And it was amazing that really no one got kicked off the program because they found work, they found opportunities, they, they had the right incentive to, in place to actually find employment prior to the deadline. I always, you know. That's why deadlines influence behavior. It's amazing how much our kids study the night before a test when they should have been studying long before. Deadlines change things. So uh, do you think we need to move more in that direction with many of these uh, uh, programs, both Mr. Mashburn and then Mr. Rector? And then I'll yield to them. Well, that's, that's the basic point about uh, whether these programs accomplish their goals. The problem is that in 95 percent of these programs, the, the goal is to give people stuff. That's the only goal. Uh, and the government can give away a lot of things. It's given away $16 trillion since mm -hmm. the beginning of the war on poverty. Um, and when you give people free food or free housing, they, they have something that they didn't have before. The problem is that in doing this, we have created a, a culture of dependency. And the more money you give, the more dependent people you generate. 
uh, the work ethic goes down and marriage disappears as the welfare check serves as a substitute for the husband. That is why you can never stop spending in these programs. The more you spend, the more need for, for assistance you generate. What you need to do in, in all of these programs is to basically say, we want to assist you, but we want to assist you in such a way that we encourage the, the best efforts on your part. We are going to require you to prepare for work or take a job. We are going to create a welfare system that isn't hostile to marriage. By the way, we are also going to tell young people that if you, if you don't want to be poor, the number one thing you can do in the United States is be married before you have a child. It is more effective than graduating from high school. No one ever knows that. No one's ever told that. Suppose we told, never told high school dropouts that dropping out of high school was, gonna, was bad for them. But in terms of the number one cause of poverty, which is non-marital birth, we never tell anyone about that. So we, we need to, to create a system that supports but at the same time encourages positive behavior. None of these programs have that objective, or, except for perhaps yeah. TANF. Uh, and therefore, uh, they can succeed, but what they are succeeding in is giving people assistance and making future generations dependent on welfare. The other thing that we need to be very careful about here is exaggerated statements about need. As I have indicated, and these figures are, are correct, that we are spending close to $30,000 when you take all these programs together, around $30,000 for each low-income family with children. Mm -hmm. Now, if we are saying that we are spending that amount of money and we still have all these kids running around with empty stomachs, I mean, I am a critic of the government, <laughs> but my goodness, that would be worse than anything I could possibly imagine. But the reality is, when we look closer at this, that in fact, we, I, and I agree that food assistance needed to go up during the recession. It has gone up. But if you look at the USDA data, which is, has a survey of food security and hunger, it, for example, shows during 2009 that of all the poor people in the poor children in the United States, only 4 percent of them had any disruption of, of food intake. That, that m might relate to hunger. Ninety-six percent of poor children did not experience that. Uh, Eighty percent of poor adults did not experience any disruption of food intake at any point during the year. It is right there in these reports, which are national surveys. So, and I think that is good. <laughs> that is not something that I am complaining about. But, but as we look at, as custodians of the Federal dollar and, and, and spending, we have to, we have to be realistic in, in understanding what the na nature of the need is and not uh, to constantly exaggerate and constantly say all we need is more money. Yes. Let me ask Ms. Hamler one question. I'll come to Mr. Mashburn and then Mr. Kucinich. Uh, Ms. Hamler, what percentage of the, the people that you serve uh, come from single-parent homes? We don't track that data, Chairman. Hazard a guess. Don't track the data. Wouldn't wouldn't but, hazard a but, guess. But you, I mean, you 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 sort of have a feeling. Is it majority? Is it is it is it getting to Mr. Rector's point that uh, we we have a system that encourages people not to be married? Um, do you, and I'm just curious if that's what you're seeing in in the food side of things versus some of the other programs. I I would agree that certainly looking at the latest census data that's come out on the community. Um, um, uh, survey that what we are seeing an increase of poverty among uh, single female headed households. Um, okay. and, and again, I, you know, this was in welfare reform. I, I do want to make a statement that in, in welfare reform, there was a lot of work that we did at the state level, as you know, with mm -hmm. the Governor's Office of Faith Based and Community Initiatives around looking at these issues and incentives, including around family formation. So I think to some degree the states have done a good job. Mr. Mashburn wanted to finish, then Mr. Kucinich. Um, I would just point out there is another GAO report that came out in February 2010, and it is temporary assistance to needy families. Fewer eligible families have received cash assistance since the 1990s. And when you first look at that, it sounds like there are a lot of people out there eligible for benefits that aren't receiving them, and the government ought to do something about it to make sure they receive it. But when you dig into the report, and they mention that you go from 57 million eligible families in 1995 down to 53 million eligible families in, in uh, 2006, I think it was, in, uh, or, no, it's 2005. Um, which is a lot less than the reduction in the TANF caseloads over that period of time. And then when you dig into the things, you, 
you realize that the way they count non-participation is the person found a job on their own or the government found them a job <laughs> before they got on the TANF. Uh, there are people not participating because they can actually make more money in some of the other welfare programs if they don't take the TANF benefits because the TANF benefits count towards your eligibility and your level of benefits and other programs like SNAP. And then finally, a lot of the non-participants didn't like the hassle of having to prove to the taxpayers that they were deserving <laughs> of help from the taxpayers because they didn't like having to go to the job interviews, the work requirements, all the other stuff. So they just said, I won't take TANF. I'll go get SNAP. I'll get some of these other benefits, but I'm not going to do that. Those were counted as non-participants and part of the group of people that the government is supposed to reach out. Well, if you got a job, you're not participating. You may be in the, low, in the income eligibility framework to be eligible for TANF, but the fact you got a job and you're self-sustaining doesn't mean the government needs to go out and sign you up for TANF and get you to quit your job. Uh, Mr. Rector, I just want to make sure that I heard you correctly. D did you say that welfare checks are a substitute for husbands? Could you turn your mic on, please? In a large part, uh, what welfare assistance has done has, is to supplant uh, the role of, of the male uh, earner in the home uh, and that I mean the numbers are just there uh, in your state. But, but you said you said welfare checks substitute for husbands. Is that yes. did you did you say that? I did. And, and I, I I just have to say that seems like uh, somewhat of a simplistic formulation. I, do you really mean that to be what you say for the record? Because if you do, we're going to have to go a little bit deeper into this. Let, let's go deeper into it. Yes, in essence, that, I mean, that may be a little bit crude, but uh, yes, I would absolutely say that welfare, not just cash checks, but the whole system, has served to, as a substitute uh, for, for the role of the, of the male breadwinner in the home, and that, in fact, without that massive level of assistance, there's no possible way that we could have uh, gone from a, four per, a 7 percent out of wedlock birth rate in 1965 to a 42 percent rate today, simply because these low-income mothers, uh, you know, would not be able to sustain those children without the government assistance. The, these low-income mothers, you want to tell me a little bit about what these low-income mothers sure. should be doing? Sure. I would be very happy. Uh, a lot of people confuse non-marital births with teen pregnancy, okay? Uh, only about uh, 7, 10 percent, 7 percent of these births occur to women, uh, girls under 18. It is mainly young adult women, say 19 to 25, okay? Um, and most of these births are intentional. Uh, the mother desires to have a child. Uh, the mother sees having a child as an important role and goal in her life. Uh, the mothers are actually, th this data I am reading to you now comes from something called the Fragile Family Survey out of Princeton University. It is very important to understanding this phenomenon. These mothers are actually also uh, quite sympathetic to toward the idea of marriage uh, in the long term. Uh, uh, they would like to have a husband and a house in the suburbs and a, uh, a couple kids and, and a minivan and a dog, and a very traditional goal. But what has happened is that we have developed a culture where they think it is not important to be married before bringing children into the world, that you have children first and then you, you look to get married. And I am not making this up. I, I come to your office and give you books and books on this, all written basically by liberal scholars. Uh, and our understanding of this has increased greatly in the last two so, years. So what do, you, what do you propose? You propose that we don't feed these children? No, that wouldn't work very well, would well, it? Now, what do you propose? W what I would propose is that each of these programs, as I tried to explain earlier, does have a penalty that if you do get married, you lose some benefits. We ought to try to soften that a bit. But the most important thing we ought to do is we ought to go into these... H how would you soften it? Well, you could either reduce the benefits that go to the single parent or you could increase the benefits 
Big why, why would you reduce anybody's benefits in a period where people are having trouble well, making would, ends meet? I, I would, don't, I would, please, I please, I don't interrupt you. Don't interrupt me. Fine. I want to uh, submit for the record an article from the New York Times uh, dated March uh, 21st, 2011. The headline says, Many low-wage jobs seen as failing to meet basic needs. I'm just going to read a few quotes from this. Uh, hard as it may be to land a job these days, getting one may uh, not be nearly enough for basic economic security. Uh, many of the jobs being added in retail, hospitality, and home health, to name a few categories, are unlikely to pay enough for workers to cover the costs of fundamentals, like housing, utilities, food, health care, transportation, and in the case of working parents, child care. It also uh, says a single worker with two young children needs an annual income of $57,756, or just over $27 an hour, to attain economic stability. And a family with two working parents and two young children needs to earn $67,920 a year, or about $16 an hour per worker. That compares with the national poverty level of $22,050 for a family of four. The most recent data from the Census Bureau found that 14.3 percent of Americans were living below the poverty line in 2009. One other quote I want to read from here. The numbers will not come as a surprise to working families who are struggling. Tara, a medical biller who declined to give her last name, said she earns $15 an hour while her husband, who works in building maintenance, makes $11.50 an hour. The couple who live in Jamaica, Queens, have three sons, age 9, 8, and 6. Quote, we tried to cut back on a lot of things, unquote, she said. But the couple has been unable to make ends meet on their wages and visit the River Fund Food Pantry in Richmond Hill every Saturday. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. How much more? Sure. Uh, we have a jobless recovery. We have the Fed printing, creating money out of nothing and, and giving it to banks. Banks not loaning money to Main Street so jobs can be created. I have never in my time seen so many people standing in line to get food, even in my own neighborhood in Cleveland. We got to be very careful about uh, um, sophistry, engaging in sophistry. Well, people are not just struggling to make ends meet, but well, people are starving. I, I you know, I, I have to tell you. I mean, I, I respect all the witnesses. You're with, with very, very kind to be here and testify, but um, there's there's a point at which. Mr. Chairman, frankly, some of this testimony is a little bit tough to Mr. Take. But, but would the gentleman agree um, that it's important for programs to have the right incentives in place? And would, would, would the gentleman agree, and I think he would, that much of the, much of the um, many of these 100-plus programs do, in fact, encourage the wrong kind of behavior. Now, what, we can disagree on what the remedy is, but I think the gentleman would agree that when you have an incentives in place that don't encourage the pursuit of work, maybe encourage more children to be born out of wedlock, wouldn't you agree that, that we at least need to try to figure out a way to address that? You know, I, I think that the, the purpose of this hearing that deals with uh, attempting to streamline programs I think it's a great idea, absolutely. I think you know we should all agree with that. But when we, but when testimony moves from that into value judgments on people, you know, particularly single women, who find themselves in extraordinary circumstances, I, mean, I would bet that there are probably a number of members of Congress who are raised by one-parent families, in particular single women, who find themselves in, in extraordinary circumstances where, no where you know, the f mother's first concern, feed her kids. That's, that's number one, even before the roof, right? So, um, you know. But would the gentleman answer the question, did, did you, don't, don't you think we do need to at least try to address the incentive situation uh, in, in these programs? I, I think we ought to get people jobs, you know, and, and jobs, you know, create, create, create work. There ought to be work, not welfare, for those who are able to work. That, that's fundamental. When you, have, when you have Wall Street accepting that a certain amount of unemployment is necessary for the, 
for the for the proper functioning of the economy, I think that is a moral question. But and, and, and would the gentleman also agree that when you have over 100 different means-tested social welfare programs, we can't determine the exact number. This is according to the GAO. We can't determine how many of those programs are successful, and we don't have any idea what the aggregate cost of all those, what we are spending on all those programs. That is a problem as well. I think we have to sort those things out while we, while we keep feeding people. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. And we will yield now to the gentlelady from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mashburn, I just want to go back to your testimony and the question, line of questioning with the chairman. Um, and I just have a quick question. Do you think that um, if we talk about block grants uh, with, for food assistance programs, do you think that there should be some requirement and attach work to it, just as we did with uh, welfare programs? Certainly. And why do you think that? Uh, it provides an incentive for people to uh, one, it doesn't rob their dignity from them. They work for some of their benefits, but, I, but at the same time, it keeps people from abusing and gaming the system. Uh, just as, as I mentioned earlier, just as some of the people don't enroll in the TANF program, even though they're eligible, they enroll in the other welfare programs. They don't enroll in TANF because they get more benefits from the other programs. It's because they don't want to have to go through the work requirements and all the other hassle, as they called, which is mentioned in the report, hassle of applying for the benefits and complying with the requirements, well, if it's too much hassle to do that, that you, that you don't want to take TANF, same situation being in food stamps. If, it's, if, if you're not willing to go through the process to justify the fact that you need help from the taxpayers and your fellow citizens, and that's too much of a hassle, in my view, I don't believe you deserve food stamps to at least go through that process. And work requirements and other requirements like that, whether it's community service or something like that, ensures that they're just not getting free money from the government. They're giving something back in return. And that does give them dignity as individuals. Thank you. Mr. Rector, I just want to go back to the line of questioning with my colleague, Mr. Kucinich. You were starting to talk to us about a, a study that was done at Princeton. And you mentioned that there was we got onto the line of questioning regarding how we could not penalize. And I think going to the Chairman's point um, that we want to we want to make sure everyone gets what they need, but we also know that there are always unintended consequences. And so you started to talk about how can we soften that so we don't discourage women, uh, single women, from getting married. Uh, let me first of all clarify, I am not talking about ripping food away from people in the middle of a recession. I think everything I was talking about here is long term, and I think I have been very clear that most of these reforms would have to take place as the recession eases. What you, you do find, though, is that you are giving uh, uh, about 75 percent of the assistance that goes to children, means-tested assistance, is going to single-parent households. Okay? The welfare state basically exists to support single parenthood. And uh, that is an unintended consequence. If you had gone back to the 1960s, and uh, at that point Daniel Patrick Moynihan warned us about this, and everybody said, oh, that is not going to happen. Well, it was much worse than he ever dreamed it could be, and it and is now affecting basically the whole bottom third of the population. So you are giving a lot of assistance now to able-bodied parents who don't work, you can begin to make the system more rational by requiring that all able-bodied recipients uh, in these programs should work or prepare for work as a condition for getting aid. That would greatly rationalize the system. You can also provide somewhat greater assistance, less discrimination against married couples. And, but let me talk about what the consequence of that would be. In this fragile family survey, like other surveys, we actually have data about the mother, but we also have data about the father, which is pretty unusual in social science because we are not very interested in fathers in this country. But the reality is that if you take these 40 percent of births that are out of wedlock, uh, this is the road to poverty in the United States. 70 percent, 75 percent of child poverty occurs to single parent families. If you took these mothers, and they were actually married to the actual father of the child, not a hypothetical, not somebody I dreamed up as a social scientist, but the actual father of the child. In two-thirds of the cases, the income that the father would bring into that home would bring the family completely out of poverty. In many cases, the mother wouldn't even have to work. This is the strongest anti-poverty weapon 
in the United States today. And then when you go and survey these women, you find, my goodness, they are not hostile to marriage. They, in fact, would like to get married, but they actually have this pattern of saying, well, I, I, I want to have a child first, then I am going to start to look around a husband, I am going to get married later on. And we, we ought to begin to explain that if you want your child not to be poor, that set of decision making is probably not the best route for you to go down. We ought to explain to them that the single largest cause of child poverty in the U.S. is, is ha having a child without being married and that, that they, they might want to look at other options to meet their own goals, not to meet my social values or your social values or anybody, but to actually meet their own personal goals, of which marriage is a substantial part and not being poor is also another substantial part. But nowhere in the welfare system do we ever provide these at-risk young people, both men and women, with this information whatsoever. And I think that is a national tragedy. Thank you. I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if, if I could just a sure. uh, uh, point of note um, to correct uh, statements that both Mr. Rector and Mr. Mashburn made, there are work requirements for both SNAP and cash assistance. Let me be clear, crystal clear. People who receive these benefits must work off those benefits. And I, in my system, have thousands of individuals that come into a food pantry, a soup kitchen, or a food bank every day, and they work hard for those benefits. Uh, Mr. Cummings? Thank you very much. It is just so interesting. I, uh, Mr. Rector, I live among the people that you just talked about. And I think that you, uh, unless you are a woman and unless you stood in a woman's place, uh, I think you make some pretty strong statements there, telling women, talking about women not wanting to be married and making a choice to have a baby first. Um, and it is interesting that, um, you know, I, I, I'm sitting here and I just can't believe what I'm hearing, but be that as it may, Ms. Hamlet, uh, Hamler, if you get one of the things that we are trying to get at in this hearing is whether certain federal programs are redundant or wasteful. We must strive to eliminate unnecessary duplication and streamline delivery of benefits, but I hope that the Republican idea of duplicative food assistance programs is not breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, help us think about this the right way from the perspective of families and seniors who are eligible for these programs. I'd like to ask you these questions. Are Ohio families you work with uh, being overfed? No, sir, they aren't. And can they take a budget cut as the Republican majority's budget imposes on food assistance they receive? No, sir, they can't. With rising food and fuel costs, they are making choices about who eats tonight and who doesn't eat. Some of the programs that you do, you deal with the school lunch program at all? Yes, sir. We work all of the federal nutrition programs through our Ohio Benefit Bank, mm -hmm. ensuring that people know about the programs and helping to streamline the application process. I also want to say that this isn't only just the greatest generation, this is the next generation, that we are losing their ability to not only for our greatest generation to live out their golden years with a little bit of dignity to be able to feed themselves, but we are sacrificing our future to allow hunger and malnutrition to exist at the rates that they do in this country. While rich folks uh, get the tax breaks. Let me, let me go to something, too, uh, Ms. Uh, Hamler, if you get. Uh, you know, the other day I was just thinking about when I was a little boy. Uh, my mother and father had a limited education. And by the way, they worked every day, Mr. Rector, every day, from sunup to down, sundown. My mother was a domestic for seven dollars and fifty cents in car fare. My father was a laborer. But we used to get graham crackers and milk every morning. And they worked hard and they were able to educate on a domestic salary and a labor salary, seven children, one of whom is a member of the Congress of the United States of America today. And I think what Ms. Hamler Fugit is trying to say is that we have to make sure that we take care of our people and we take care of our children. Um, you know, if I did a, a, a rewind, if I took some of the positions I guess that you're taking, I wouldn't be here today, nor would my, my, my fellow brothers and sisters.
be achieving the things that they achieve. Are they, uh, going back to you, Ms. Hamler, if you get, uh, are they enrolled in multiple job training programs, these folks that you see, or is there a waiting list for job programs? Again, with, um, with uh, welfare reform and, and uh, not only passage of the Personal Responsibility Work and Opportunity Reconciliation Act, but the Workforce Investment Act, again, these were devolved. Uh, and a lot of what's happened in the fragmented systems is that they not only were devolved to the states, but they were also devolved to the county level, and we're a county-operated system. So it's the luck of the draw. Right, really, a lot of people are trying to train for jobs that aren't, aren't even there. Is that right? And we are seeing record uh, enrollment in community colleges where people are trying to get new skills and upgrade their skills. But again, um, there are limited slots available to these programs. I'd like to speak to just one in particular. And while you're talking about that, do, I want you to answer this. Do all homeless individuals have access to shelter, and are they getting two beds for the night because of duplicative assistance? Uh, as to the um, homelessness question, uh, no. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, do not have two beds, and in fact, uh, many uh, now find themselves, uh, if they're lucky, to have a family or a friend that's taken them in. We've seen household uh, demographics increasing substantially because families have lost their homes. Uh, the shelters are full in the state of Ohio. We have families who are sleeping in cars at roadside rest in the state of Ohio, and I suspect it's in the sta same uh, in your state. In the United uh, States of America. Yes, sir. All right. And uh, two, uh, whether there are sufficient in, uh, job training programs. There is a, a program that we're seeing more seniors than we've ever seen try to reenter the workforce despite their efforts of working hard, thinking that they had saved enough for their golden years. They are attempting to we enter the workforce, and there is a program called the Ohio Senior Community Services Employment Program, or CSEP program, that's designed specifically to help older adults age 55 uh, to access meaningful job training um, skills on the, on the job training. There are a limited number of slots, and I can tell you from firsthand experiences, we get calls every day from seniors who are begging to get into this program and it pays a, a modest $7.25 an hour. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your courtesy. I see my time is expiring. Uh, they, they, just one last question for Mr. Mashburn. If, uh, if in fact, uh, social welfare spending for these 100-plus programs that we can't determine exactly the number, but for all these programs, it just went like that. It steadily increased. That's true over the 40-some years we've had. Um, so it's, it's always been increasing. Then, then, then why the terrible results? If, it, if, it's, if it's all about money, why the terrible? If, if it, all we've been doing is we've been increasing money for this all along, doesn't it make sense to, to look at, well, we've got to look at this somehow different and figure if we can, if we can combine programs, uh, make it work more efficiently? Because if we just keep doing the same old thing, we'll keep spending the same old amount of money, and Mrs. Ms. Hamler is going to have more people coming to her to, uh, who are going to need food and we are going to need assistance because obviously it's not working the way it was supposed to. Well, I suspect that she talked about it's devolved to the state level and then devolved to the county level. level. If there are work requirements in the SNAP program in Ohio, it's probably because either the state or, or, or the county has required it. There you go. Uh, it, it, as far as the money spent, well, you, you keep spending the money unless you start getting people incentives and help them find jobs so that they don't need the system. If you just support them in their status quo in the system so that you don't train them and there's no penalty for staying, you're, you're going to get the, All the, the caseload you got, yeah. plus you're going to get future caseload as well, which is why this spending keeps going up. Ms. Dalton, is the GAO going to come forward with what you recommend? I mean, we, 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 we know the problem. We know we don't, we don't know what we're spending. We know it's a lot, and it's been $16 trillion over the last 50 years. Um, so we know we're spending a lot. We can't determine the number of programs. We, can't, we don't know which ones are ultimately successful. We do know that this food program is working in, in Ohio, but we don't know everywhere else what's going on. So is the GAO AO going to come forward with recommendations on what to do? We're not going to make specific recommendations in the, the debate. The, the, the discussion here has shown that this is really a policy issue. What we do talk about is the need for good data, the need to rationalize the system. It's a system that in all of the areas that I discussed, it evolved over time with very good intentions, but now we have 80 programs here, 40 programs there. There's a need to look at what do we want to achieve, who do we want to serve, and what's the best way 
to achieve that? I think those are the three basic questions that need to be answered. And then to develop, to design the programs to achieve those. Just when I thought we were going to do it, Ms. Perkle wants one last question, then we will be done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick question. Um, is there no, um, for an organization that receives Federal dollars, is there no requirement that they track their results? Does anyone know the answer to that question? I, I do. Basically, for example, with job training, there's, there are not requirements, and when you do have a requirement, for example, to run a, control, a, a controlled experiment, the programs are not very effective. I would also say that when you do have information in the political system, it tends to get disregarded. Uh, I, I would reference you all to a report called the 2009 Annual Homeless Assessment Report, which is prepared by HUD for the Congress. I will give you a copy of that. It says very different things than what you just heard here, and it happens to be a survey of every homeless shelter in the United States conducted on scientific basis. Okay, and what it shows is actually no increase in the use of homeless shelters over the last three years, and the average homeless shelter in the United States on any given night has a vacancy rate of 10 percent. Now, I, if we are just not going to use information like that, I suspect we could just cut these reports out and basically just make things up. Thank you. Uh, the uh, general lady yield? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, sure. Just, just for a moment. May I ask the gentleman a question? I, are you saying, sir, that uh, there has been no increase in homelessness or just that there is no increase in the use of homeless shelters? The report shows neither, neither increase, which I, I also find surprising. But more importantly, it basically shows that the level of homelessness is relatively low and that the homeless shelters, on average, on a continuing basis, have vacancies. Thank you. Ms. Dalton, you appeared to have a, be ready to have an Yeah, I, I, there are a couple of points I would want to make in terms of determining whether the programs are effective and what they are required to do. Most of the programs do have requirements to, pr to present some performance information. Whether or not it is the right information and whether it is integrated um, is oftentimes not done. There is a new um, law that the Congress passed um, last year called the Government Performance and Results Act, Modernization Act. That act is requiring improved performance reporting by Federal agencies and, most importantly, is targeting toward coordinated performance information that is trying to get information about programs that work together. It will be um, important to implement that act properly, and I think that may at least start us on a path to some quality performance information. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank our witnesses again for good discussion, and uh, we are uh, we're adjourned. <laughs>